David Ola Lere Oyetunji, Amos Ola Dipo Oyetunji, and Paul Ajibola Oyetunji had a cruise experience to Statue of Liberty in New York, United States of America, USA. You may want to know what is cruise. Cruise is a voyage or movement on a ship or boat taken for pleasure or as a holiday and usually calling in at several places. The Statue of Liberty is located at Liberty Island. History of Statue of Liberty The Two Sisters America probably could not have won its freedom from the British during the American Revolution without the help of the French. French. France provided arms, ships, money, and men to the American colonies. Some Frenchmen, most notably the Marcus de la Fayette, a close friend of George Washington, even became high-ranking officers in the American Army. It was an alliance of respect and friendship that the French would not forget. Almost 100 years later, in 1865, after the end of the American Civil War, several French intellectuals who were opposed to the oppressive regime of Napoleon III were at a small dinner party. They discussed their admiration for America's success in establishing a democratic government and abolishing slave slavery at the end of the Civil War. The dinner was hosted by Edward René Levebreu Leve de Laboyalaye. Laboyalaye was a scholar, jurist, abolitionist, and a leader of the Libras, the political group dedicated to establishing a French Republican government. During the evening, talk turned to the close historic ties and love of liberty the two nations share. Labolayan noted that there was a genuine flow of sympathy between the two nations and he called France and America the two
Statue of Liberty National Monument History of Statue of Liberty The Two Sisters America probably could not have won its freedom from the British during the American Revolution without the help of the French. France provided arms, ships, money, and men to the American colonies. Some Frenchmen, most notably the Marquis de Lafayette, a close friend of George Washington, even became high-ranking officers in the American army. It was an alliance of respect and friendship that the French would not forget. Almost 100 years later, in 1865, after the end of the American Civil War, several French intellectuals, who were opposed to the oppressive regime of Napoleon III, were at a small dinner party. They discussed their admiration for America's success in establishing a democratic government and abolishing slavery at the end of the Civil War. The dinner was hosted by Edouard René Lefebvre de Labolle. Labolle was a scholar, jurist, abolitionist, and a leader of the Liberals, the political group dedicated to establishing a French Republican government. During the evening, talk turned to the close historic ties and love of liberty the two nations shared. Labolle noted that there was a genuine flow of sympathy between the two nations and he called France and America, the two sisters. Statue of Liberty 50 Fascinating Facts 1. The statue's full name is Liberty Enlightening the World. 2. It was a gift from France, given to America in 1886. 3. The head of the statue was displayed at the World's Fair in Paris in 1878. 4. The robed female figure represents Libertas, the Roman goddess of freedom. 5. She holds a torch and tablet upon which is inscribed the date of American Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. 6. From the ground to the top of the torch the statue measures 93 meters, and weighs 204 metric tons. 7. Lady Liberty wears a size 879 shoe. 8. She has a 35-foot waistline. 9. Visitors have to climb 354 stairs to reach the statue's crown. 10. There are 25 windows in the crown. The Eiffel Tower, and 3.5 M visit the London Eye. 12. The seven spikes on the crown represent the seven oceans and the seven continents of the world, indicating the universal concept of liberty. 13. The statue has an iron infrastructure and copper exterior which has turned green due to oxidation. Although it's a sign of damage, the patina, green coating, also acts as a form of protection from further deterioration. 14. Edouard de Labolle provided the idea for the statue, while Frederick Augusta Bartholdi designed it. 15. Labolle proposed that a great monument should be given as a gift from France to the United States as a celebration of both the Union's victory in the American Revolution, and the abolition of slavery. 16. Labolle also hoped the gift of the statue would inspire French people to fight for their own democracy in the face of a repressive monarchy under Napoleon III. 17. Gustave Eiffel, the man who designed the Eiffel Tower was also behind the design for Liberty's spine, four iron columns supporting a metal framework that holds the copper skin which is a mere 3-32 ths of an inch thick. 18. 300 different types of hammers were used to create the copper structure. 19. The statue's face was said to be modeled on the sculptor's mother, Charlotte. 20. The statue's original torch was replaced in 1984 by a new copper torch covered in 2-4K gold leaf. 21. Although you cannot see Lady Liberty's feet clearly she is in fact standing among a broken shackle and chains, with her right foot raised, depicting her moving forward away from oppression and slavery. 22. Despite the positive meaning of the statue, American independence and the abolition of slavery, it African Americans saw the statue as an ironic image of America, professing to be a country of freedom and justice for everyone regardless of race, despite racism and discrimination continuing to exist. 23 The Statue of Liberty became the symbol of immigration during the second half of the 19th century, as over 9m immigrants came to the United States, with the statue often being the first thing they saw when arriving by boat. 24 The statue's most famous cinematic appearance was in the 1968 film Planet of the Apes where it is seen half buried in sand. 25 It is also destroyed in the films Independence Day and The Day After Tomorrow.
26 The cost of the statue was funded by contributions from both the French and the Americans. In 1885, a New York newspaper entitled World announced that $102,000 had been raised from donors, and that 80 percent of this total had been received in sums of less than $1. 27 groups in Boston and Philadelphia offered to pay the full cost of the construction of the statue, in return for its relocation. 28 When the statue was first erected in 1886 it was the tallest iron structure ever built. 29 In 1984, the statue was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 30 In high winds of 50 miles per hour Lady Liberty can sway by up to 3 inches, while her torch can move 5 inches. 31 Lady Liberty is thought to have been hit by around 600 bolts of lightning every year since she was built. A photographer captured this for the first time in 2010. 32 Two people have committed suicide by jumping off the statue, one in 1929 and the other in 1932, while many others have jumped and survived. 33 American poet Emma Lazarus wrote about the Statue of Liberty in a sonnet called The New Colossus, 1883. In 1903 the poem was engraved on a bronze plaque and placed inside the lower level of the pedestal on the statue. 34 The island in which it stands was previously called Bedloe Island, but its name was changed in 1956 to Liberty Island. 35 There are various replicas of the statue, including a smaller version in Paris, and one on the Las Vegas Strip in Nevada. 36 In 1944, the lights in the crown flashed dot 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 dash which in the Morse code means V, for victory in Europe. 37 Andy Warhol painted Statue of Liberty as part of his pop art series in the 1960s. It is estimated to be worth in excess of $35 million. 38 The statue functioned as a lighthouse for 16 years, 1886 to 1902, lighting a distance of up to 24 miles away. 39 The statue will be celebrating its 127th birthday in October 2013. 40 Miss America, the comic book character, was granted her powers by the statue. 41 After the terrorist attacks of September 11, the statue was closed for security reasons, with the pedestal reopening in 2004, and the statue in 2009, but only a limited number of visitors are able to go up to the crown. 42 The statue was again closed in 2012 due to the effects of Hurricane Sandy, with the island off-limits to the public. The statue is reopening to visitors on Independence Day, July 4, 2013. 43 The statue sustained minor damage in 1916 when German saboteurs set off an explosion during World War I. The torch-bearing arm suffered the most damage, with repair works costing $100,000. The stairs in the torch were then closed to the public for safety reasons, and have remained closed ever since. 44 No one has been able to visit the torch since. 45 Private boats are not allowed to dock at Liberty and Ellis Islands. Therefore the only way on is via the ferry system. 46 The statue's 300 copper pieces were transported to America in 214 crates on the French ship Isara, which almost sank in stormy seas. 47 Liberty Island is federal property within the territory of the state of New York, even though it is closer to New Jersey. 48 In 1982, it was discovered that the head had been installed two feet off center. 49 Two images of the statue appear on a $10 bill. 50 The cost of building the statue and pedestal amounted to over $500,000, over $10 million in today's money. Here are just 10 of the little-known facts about America's Colossus. 1. The Statue of Liberty was not a gift from France to America. We have all heard the shorthand that implies that the statue was exchanged government to government. In fact, Frederick Augusta Bartholdi, a mid-career statue maker, decided to pitch a country he had never visited before on his vision to build a massive lighthouse in the shape of a woman. In his diaries and letters, he described his journey to all corners of America, from Niagara Falls to Washington, D.C., from Chicago to Los Angeles, to explore this exotic land and drum up support. 
when no significant government funding emerged, he contrived every possible fundraising strategy himself. He put on spectacles of wonder in Paris, charged visitors admission to watch the statue's construction in a dusty workshop, sold souvenirs, and petitioned the French government to let him run a national lottery. In the end it was Joseph Pulitzer, the American newspaper magnate, who helped him finish the job by printing the names of every person who donated even a penny to the cause. This strategy rapidly boosted the circulation of Pulitzer's newspaper when readers bought a copy simply to see their names in the paper a brilliant marketing strategy. Getty Images 2. The statue was originally designed for the Suez Canal in Egypt. Bartholdi did not craft the basic design of liberty specifically for America. As a young man, he had visited Egypt and was enchanted by the project underway to dig a channel between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. At Paris World's Fair of 1867, he met with the Khedive, the leader of Egypt, and proposed creating a work as wondrous as the pyramids or sphinxes. He then designed a colossal woman holding up a lamp and wearing the loose-fitting dress of a fella, a slave, to stand as a lighthouse at the entrance of the Suez Canal. The Egypt deal fell through, so Bartholdi decided to adventure to America to pitch his colossus. Three Americans were very slow to welcome Bartholdi's statue. So how excited were Americans about the possibility of giving a home to this new monument? Initial fundraising and support was extremely lackluster. It took about 15 years, with the statue completed and assembled in a neighborhood of Paris, before the American citizenry finally began to embrace it. For the statue's torch was exhibited in Philadelphia and she almost ended up there. The torch was exhibited to great success at the 1876 World's Fair in Fairmount Park, Philadelphia, fairgoers paid admission to climb up into the torch and take in the view from the top. With the funds raised from that exhibit, Bartholdi finally had enough capital to build the statue's head. He was so pleased with Philadelphia's reception to the statue that for a time he considered giving it to them instead of New York. 5. The Statue of Liberty also nearly went to Boston. In 1882, when the statue was well under construction in Paris, but fundraising efforts were stalling in New York, Boston made a play to get the statue. Proving that nothing motivates New Yorkers so well as rivalry, the New York Times retorted in an editorial. Boston proposes to take our neglected Statue of Liberty and warm it over for her own use and glory. Boston has probably again overestimated her powers. This statue is dear to us, though we have never looked upon it, and no third-rate town is going to step in and take it from us. Philadelphia tried to do that in 1876, and failed. Let Boston be warned that she can't have our liberty, that great lighthouse statue will be smashed into, fragments before it shall be stuck up in Boston Harbor. Six New York City's Central Park and Prospect Park were both considered as locations. When Bartholdi first arrived in New York in 1871, he considered Brooklyn's Prospect Park and the newly constructed Central Park as possible locations for the statue. Had he chosen to build the Statue of Liberty in Central Park, the famed Dakota apartment building would not even have reached to her big toe. Getty Images 7. The statue was originally supposed to be a lighthouse. When Ulysses Grant authorized the use of Bedloe Island, now Liberty Island, for the statue, he specified that the Statue of Liberty would be a lighthouse. That would give the lady a purpose, and therefore, would merit government funding. However, the engineers were never able to successfully light it enough to serve that purpose a cause of extreme frustration for Bartholdi. Over time, it would be clear that the site of Bedloe's Island was too far inland for it to be a good position for a lighthouse, anyway. 8. Bartholdi planned for the statue to be covered in gold. In order to make the statue visible after dark, Bartholdi proposed that Americans raise the money to gild her. However, given how daunting and arduous a task it had been to gather even enough money to place the statue in New York Harbor, no one followed through on paying the enormous cost of covering the massive statue in gold. 9. Thomas Edison once had plans to make the statue talk. 
when Edison introduced the phonograph to the public in 1878, he told the newspapers that he was designing a monster disc for the interior of the Statue of Liberty that would allow the statue to deliver speeches that could be heard up to the northern part of Manhattan and across the bay. Thankfully, no one pursued that strange promise, which would have led to the odd experience of walking in New York and suddenly hearing the Statue of Liberty talking. Ten suffragettes protested the unveiling of the statue. When it was unveiled in October 1886, women's rights groups lamented that an enormous female figure would stand in New York Harbor representing liberty, when most American women had no liberty to vote. Only two women attended the actual unveiling on what is now known as Liberty Island, Bartholdi's wife, and the 13-year-old daughter of Ferdinand de Lesseps, the French engineer who had designed the Suez Canal. The wives of the American committee members were forced to watch the proceedings from a Navy vessel off the island. Suffragettes chartered a boat to circle the island during the unveiling. They blasted protest speeches, but those could not be heard over the din of steam whistles and cannon blasts in the harbor. As he continued speaking, reflecting on the centennial of American independence only 11 years in the future, Labole commented, wouldn't it be wonderful if people in France gave the United States a great monument as a lasting memorial to independence and thereby showed that the French government was also dedicated to the idea of human liberty. Labolle's question struck a responsive chord in one of his guests, Frederick Augusta Bartholdi, a successful, 31-year-old sculptor from Colmar, a town in the eastern province of Alsace, France. Years later, recalling the dinner, Bartholdi wrote that Labolle's idea interested me so deeply that it remained fixed in my memory. So was sown the seed of inspiration that would become the Statue of Liberty. Frederick Augusta Bartholdi The sculptor who designed the Statue of Liberty, Frederick Augusta Bartholdi, was born into a well-to-do family in Colmar, France on August 2, 1834. Bartholdi's father, a civil servant and prosperous landowner, died when the child was only two years old, so he was raised by his stern, possessive mother, Charlotte. Bartholdi began his career as a painter, but it was as a sculptor that he was to express his true spirit and gain his greatest fame. His first commission for a public monument came to him at the young age of 18. It was for a statue of one of Colmar's native sons, General Jean Rapp, a leader of Napoleon Bonaparte's army. Even at 18, Bartholdi loved bigness. The statue of the general was 12 feet tall and was created in Bartholdi's studio, where the ceiling was only one inch higher. The statue established his reputation as a sculptor of note and led to many commissions for similar, oversized, patriotic works. A man of his time, Bartholdi wasn't alone in his passion for art on a grand scale. During the 19th century, large-scale public monuments were an especially popular art form. It was an age of ostentation, largely inspired by classical Greek and Roman civilizations. Most monuments reflected either the dress or architecture of these ancient times, so the artistic style of the 19th century came to be known as neoclassical. The Statue of Liberty would be patterned after the goddess, Libertas, the Roman personification of freedom but it was a trip to Egypt that shifted Bartholdi's artistic perspective from simply grand to colossal. The overwhelming size and mysterious majesty of the pyramids and the Sphinx were awesome to the enthusiastic young Bartholdi. He wrote, Their kindly and impassive glance seems to ignore the present and to be fixed upon an unlimited future. In 1870, with the beginning of the Franco-Prussian War, Bartholdi served as a major in the French army in his hometown of Colmar. When the Germans annexed the entire Alsace region, making its residents German citizens, the reality of the word liberty took on a new, personal meaning for Bartholdi. In time, France's Third Republic, would emerge out of the ruins of the Franco-Prussian War. Meanwhile, partially as propaganda to advance the cause of those who were seeking the creation of a French Republic, Labolle suggested that Bartholdi should travel to America. In recalling his conversation with Labolle several years later, Bartholdi wrote, Go to see that country, said he Labolle to me. Propose to our friends over there to make with us a monument, a common work, 
in remembrance of the ancient friendship of France and the United States. If, you find a plan that will excite public enthusiasm, we are convinced that it will be successful on both continents, and we will do a work that will have far-reaching moral effect. Bartholdi responded, I will try to glorify the Republic and liberty over there, in the hope that someday I will find it again here. So Bartholdi was now to become a salesman. Armed with letters of introduction from Labole to some of America's most influential men, Bartholdi sailed to New York in 1871. Writing of his entrance into New York Harbor, he said, The picture that is presented to the view when one arrives in New York is marvelous, when, after some days of voyaging, in the pearly radiance of a beautiful morning is revealed the magnificent spectacle of those immense cities Brooklyn and Manhattan, of those rivers extending as far as the eye can reach, festooned with masts and flags, when one awakes, so to speak, in the midst of that interior sea covered with vessels, it is thrilling. It is, indeed, the new world, which appears in its majestic expanse, with the ardor of its glowing life. New York Harbor was the perfect locale, he added, since it was where people get their first view of the new world. Continuing, he said, I've found an admirable spot. It is Bedloe's Island, in the middle of the bay. The island belongs to the government, it's on national territory, belonging to all the states, just opposite the Narrows, which are, so to speak, the gateway to America. Intelligent, warm, persuasive, and charming, Bartholdi impressed the many prominent Americans he met, including President Ulysses S. Grant, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Horace Greeley, and Senator Charles Sumner. His trip across America filled him with amazement. He wrote, Everything in America is big. Here, even the peas are big. Everywhere he went, he enthusiastically promoted the sketch and a model he carried of the statue as it would appear on the island in New York Harbor. Americans seemed receptive to the idea of a statue dedicated to liberty enlightening the world, the official name for the statue, but no one was willing to make a commitment of money or a building site. Back in France, Labole was waiting, until the Third Republic became a reality, to publicize the idea of the statue. Upon his return, Bartholdi completed other projects, all the while refining his ideas and design for the American statue. In 1875, with the establishment of the Third Republic, Labole and Bartholdi agreed that the ladies' time had come. Because the project would be extremely expensive, they decided its cost should be shared, France would pay for the statue, America would pay for its pedestal and foundation. A fundraising committee called the Franco-American Union was formed with members from both nations. Elaborate fundraising events were staged, but money was slow in coming. Enough was collected to begin work on the statue, but the goal of completing it in time for America's 100th anniversary was impossible. Work begins. Bartholdi selected Gaget, Gautier, and company as the foundry where the sculpture was to be constructed. Its craftsmen were experts in the art of repoussé, a technique for creating sculptural forms by hammering sheet metal inside molds. Lighter than casting metal, repoussé was the only method available that would allow such a monumental work to be shipped overseas. The intricate skeleton for the statue was designed by famed engineer Alexander Gustav Eiffel, already known for his brilliant iron railroad bridges and later celebrated for the Eiffel Tower. Bartholdi was chosen as an official French representative to the International Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876. With three major sculptures on view at the exhibition, Bartholdi's name was becoming known in America. The 30-foot Arm of Liberty traveled to Philadelphia in 1876, as well. For 50 cents, a visitor could climb a steel ladder to the balcony around the torch. A good deal of enthusiasm was generated for the project, since Liberty would be the first statue one could climb inside. When Liberty's gleaming copper head appeared at the fair, she was a sensation. She wasn't sensational enough, however, to solve the never-ending problem of raising the money to complete her construction. Fundraising in France Someone with the Franco-American Union had an inspiration, they would hold a lottery. 
Since very few contributions were coming from France's moneyed elite, the idea of engaging the public's attention with a lottery was a brilliant one. The prizes were highly coveted and valuable, including two works by Bartholdi himself. Additional funds were raised in a manner worthy of contemporary merchandising techniques, a signed and numbered collection of clay models of the statue were sold in France and America. By the end of 1879, about 250,000 francs, approximately $750,000 US, had been raised for the statue's construction. Enough, most people thought, to complete the work. Finus. At last, in June 1884, Liberty received her final touches. In May 1883, Labole died of a heart ailment, never to see his dream come to life. She was dedicated with much pomp and circumstance by French Prime Minister Jules Ferry and Ambassador Morton. But when Bartholdi invited the celebrating party to join him in climbing the statue steps, few accepted the challenge. Until the spring of 1885, when she was dismantled for the long voyage to America, Liberty remained in Paris, the hostess to thousands of French visitors. Fundraising in America While the statue was nearing completion in France, little was happening on the American side. The American press continued to be critical of the project, especially of its cost. They couldn't understand why the pedestal should cost as much as the statue itself. Congress rejected a bill appropriating $100,000 for the base. New York approved a grant of $50,000, but the expenditure was vetoed by the governor. Many Americans outside of New York considered it New York's statue. Let New York pay for it, they said, while America's newly rich, self-made millionaires were saying and contributing nothing. The American half of the Franco-American Union, led by William M. Everts, held the usual fundraising events, but public apathy was almost as monumental as the statue itself. By 1884, after years of fundraising, only $182,491 had been collected and $179,624 had been spent. It took the intervention of Joseph Pulitzer and the power of the media to make a difference. Pulitzer to the rescue Joseph Pulitzer was a Hungarian immigrant who fought in the Civil War, became a successful journalist and married a wealthy woman. In 1883, he bought a financial newspaper called The World, he already owned the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. When he heard that the Statue of Liberty was about to die from lack of funds, he saw his chance to take advantage of three distinct opportunities, to raise funds for the statue, to increase his newspaper's circulation and to blast the rich for their selfishness. Pulitzer set the fundraising goal of the world at $100,000. In its pages he taunted the rich, thereby increasing the paper's appeal among working-class people, and firmly planted the notion that the statue was a monument not just for New York City but, indeed, for all of America. Perhaps Pulitzer's cleverest ploy was the promise to publish the name of every single contributor in the pages of the world, no matter how small the contribution. The editorial that opened the fundraising campaign set its tone. He wrote, The world is the people's paper and it now appeals to the people to come forward and raise the money for the statue's pedestal. The statue, he said, was paid for by the masses of the French people. Let us respond in like manner. Let us not wait for the millionaires to give this money. It is not a gift from the millionaires of France to the millionaires of America, but a gift of the whole people of France to the whole people of America. The circulation of the world increased by almost 50,000 copies. African American newspapers joined in the effort, encouraging their readers to contribute to a monument that would, in part, commemorate the end of slavery. So the money poured in, as single-dollar donations from grandmothers and pennies from the piggy banks of school children. On June 15, 1885, the Statue of Liberty arrived at Bedloe's Island inside 214 wooden packing crates. On August 11, 1885, the front page of the world proclaimed, $100,000. The goal had been reached, and slightly exceeded, 
thanks to more than 120,000 contributions. The place on which she stands. The architect for Liberty's pedestal, Richard Morris Hunt, was a highly respected and popular designer of expensive homes. He designed an 89-foot high pedestal that would sit upon a concrete foundation that would appear to grow up from within the 11-pointed, star-shaped walls of the existing Fort Wood. His fee for the project was $1,000, which he returned to the fund to reassemble the statue. General Charles P. Stone was the chief engineer in charge of the entire construction project, including the foundation, the pedestal, and the reassembly of the statue. Liberty's foundation alone required 24,000 tons of concrete, the largest single mass ever poured at that time. It measures 52 feet, 10 inches in height. At the bottom, it is 91 feet, and at the top, it is 65 feet. The pedestal rises 89 feet above the foundation. The Statue of Liberty began to rise over her new home in America in May of 1886. It would take six months to mount the statue to her base. The dream accomplished. On October 25, 1886, Bartholdi and his wife, accompanied by Viscount Ferdinand Marie de Lesseps, chairman of the Franco-American Union, arrived in America. They were greeted by the American Committee and Joseph Pulitzer. At Bedloe's Island, surrounded by newspaper reporters recording his words for posterity, Bartholdi simply said, the dream of my life is accomplished. The Unveiling of the Lady Unveiling Day, October 28, 1886, was declared a public holiday. The rainy, foggy day could not dampen the spirits of the more than one million people who lined New York's streets, draped with red, white, and blue and French tricolor bunting, to watch a parade of more than 20,000 pass by. Wall Street was the only area of the city working on the Day of Liberty's unveiling. The New York Times reported that as the parade passed by, the office boys from a hundred windows began to unreel the spools of tape that record the fateful messages of the ticker. In a moment the air was white with curling streamers. And so the famous New York ticker tape parade was born. Dignitaries from both nations were in attendance. Representing America were President Grover Cleveland and his cabinet as well as the governor of New York and his staff. The French ambassador attended, accompanied by the French committee. And, most ironically, members of some of America's wealthiest families, the same families who had not contributed a single cent to the statue's pedestal, now jockeyed for seats of prominence. New York, reported the world, was one vast cheer. Out on the water, the fog rolled in and out. The harbor teemed with ships of all sizes. Bartholdi stood alone in the head of the statue. He was to pull a cord that would drop the French tricolor veil from the face of the statue. For his cue, Bartholdi was to watch for a signal from a boy on the ground below, who would wave a handkerchief. The signal would come when Senator William M. Everts, considered one of the more talented orators of his time, finished his presentation speech. Everts began his speech, stopped momentarily to take a breath, and the boy, thinking the speech was over, gave Bartholdi the signal. Bartholdi pulled the cord, revealing the statue's gleaming copper face to the world. Whistles blasted, guns roared, bands played, and Everts sat down. When it was President Cleveland's turn to speak, he said, We will not forget that Liberty has made here her home, nor shall her chosen altar be neglected. Liberty's First 100 Years At the time of the Statue of Liberty's dedication, she was the tallest structure in New York, region.